Greetings, brethren. Philippians chapter 2, verse 2. That's going to be the passage I'm going to be speaking from tonight. And this passage reads, Fulfill my joy by being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord and of one mind. Now tonight, what the thoughts I want to share with you concern the harmony we experience as we gather together tonight. God not only requires unity in our speech, but he also requires harmony in our thoughts, our conclusions, and our desires as well. When believers are doing the things in this passage, it's not only helping the body to work at its best capacity, but it's bringing joy to the hearts of those who observe it. And I will say a word on a divided environment, which is not what this passage is about, but due to the extremely divided church that's around us, men have managed to doubt the word of the Lord on this matter of harmony and unity. Churches have split because of differing opinions and views, systematized doctrines and teachings, and also having different focus. One church is focused there, one's here. They won't reconcile, they just burst asunder. They split. Particularly in our time, men have managed to view things like having one mind, having the same judgment, or speaking the same thing as an impossibility. They really have. People actually read passages like this one I've just read to you about, being one mind, and even that text in 1 Corinthians 1.10 where it's just speak the same thing. Be perfectly joined together, perfectly joined together in one mind and one judgment. And they say, well, that doesn't mean we all believe the same thing. This is how they'll respond because of the, due to the environment that they're in. They're not actually seeing this happen. Or they'll say something like, well, that's something we strive for, but it's not something that actually happens. It's just something we want to happen. Today, I feel a unified church is one that just tries to get along by putting their differences aside and tolerating each other. Like, um, well... Anything that we disagree on, we just won't talk about that. That's, that's a unified church. Or, or we'll, we'll talk about just the two or three things we can't agree on. Then, then there will be a unified church. Then unity to some people, just like, well, even though we don't agree on anything, we'll, just, uh, we'll shake hands anyway, and we'll smile at each other, and you're still welcome to come on our church, even though we don't see anything remotely the same. This is what I believe people have come to view as unified. And this, this is not so in the scriptures. To me, such thinking is the result of men being content with division and not, take, and not thinking of it as a serious matter. Scriptures say God's not the author of confusion and Christ is not divided. To me, that makes it pretty clear. Any attempt to condone remaining divided is to be shunned and discarded. In the scriptures, division is associated with being carnal and worldly. That alone should cause believers to make, take unity more seriously. And just for the sake of me not being misunderstood, I will say, oh, note, because there are about this note, like maybe on occasion you might have a differing view on something. Maybe a clash of opinion. And the only time I can think of where a differing view is permitted in the scriptures is when it involves believers needing to mature more. In Romans 14, this kind of matter is addressed where one has weaker faith, believes something differently than the one who has mature faith. In this case, the one who is weak in faith is to be received based on the fact that God receives him. Both the mature and the weaker are admonished not to judge one another, and that they stand or fall to their own master. Now, when considering this matter of weak faith, it's important to note that the weak faith is the source of the differing view. If the faith were mature, this probably would not be an issue. What I'm getting at is that there are some things that are just a matter of growth. And the the growth is experienced, understanding becomes more harmonious. So we forbear in such cases, believing that as we advance together, that there will eventually be harmonious understanding on certain matters. I mean, that's just the way it has to be. Sometimes at the level a person's at, they're not able to see at the moment, but when they grow, they will be able to see it. If they're honest, they search this thing out. This is the best way to do it. So from one perspective, it's not necessary in these kind of cases to divide, to split. We're just not going to fellowship with anyone. That's not necessary, but at the same time, it is a means to an end. So eventually, that harmony will be there, is what I'm getting at. Now, in this main passage, this Philippians chapter 2, he starts off, he says, Fulfill my joy, or fulfill ye my joy. I have seen some different takes on this passage. Two, I think, fit well with it. Some of them say, fill me with joy. That's what one version says. Get me, like, fill me to the top, of, so to speak. Another one says, complete my joy. That's, how another, that's, that's another rendering of that. Like, there's things about, there's things that he's seeing that are very, that they bring joy to him. And then if he were to see this thing here, that would, like, bring it to its completion. To full joy, you could say. The Apostle Paul would be pleased with them greatly. He would rejoice and be glad to see these things occurring. I believe this is something we can all say to each other as well. 
Like this is something I can say to you. This would fulfill my joy if I were to see this thing. This is something Brother Given can say to us. This is something Brother Bob, Sister Michelle. We could all say this to each other that if we see these things being experienced among us, this would make all of us joyous in our hearts. Amen. But he starts, he says, be like-minded. Brothers and sisters in Christ are much. Just be like-minded. Other versions say, thinking the same way, agreeing wholeheartedly with each other, and having harmony of feeling. In this case, believers think the same way in their minds or they're pointed in the same direction. There are similar distinctions, thoughts, and judgments when pottering certain truths. And when hearing the truth, all of you, you hear the truth on a frequent basis. And in this case, if like mine, it's like what I think when I'm hearing the truth doesn't conflict with what any of you think. We're all like arriving at the same conclusion. And I believe this is made very evident amongst us quite a bit when several of us, when commenting, say almost identical things. In other cases, some of us get up and we speak things that are almost identical. I don't know how many times I've wanted to say something, like during a Bible class or maybe like after the, during the comments, I want to raise my hand. Someone came and just took the words right out of my mouth. It's if, they, it's, if, it's if they knew exactly what I was going to say. I mean, I think everyone's experienced that in some way, but that, I think, is what this is talking about, like-minded. We're all thinking the same way. We're all like, kind of like shaping our thoughts in a similar fashion. And this is the will of God, and it's a sign that the God's working in the gathering as well. To me, this, that's the example. And the term, the term itself, it, it accents agreement between believers. Total agreement, not just agreement on certain issues, A, B, and C, but not D. Everything. We're all, like, we're, all get, we're all coming to the same point. But then he comes to this expression. He says, have the same love. And now, to me, this, that's no means. Of, that's not a simple thing being declared here. You'll see that the apostle is saying, the same, he's saying the, kind of the same basic thing here in a variety of ways, or from different aspects. First, the, same, the way we think is the same, but now it says the very things that we love is the same also. That love, I should say, is the same. That too must be. But what exactly does that mean? To be honest, explaining this was quite a challenge for a while. What is this referred to loving the same objects? Or does it refer to having the same level or amount of love? Perhaps it's talking about that. Or maybe it's talking about the same kind of love. Well, my conclusion is this, that all these things are involved in the meaning here. Well, I'm going to start with that first one there, the, th the things that we love. Indeed, as new creations, we have new desires as well. We love the things that are heavenly and spiritually. We love the, we love the saints of God, which is an evidence that you love God. We also love the Lord Jesus Christ. The point of this particular thought is that the saints take and join in the pleasure in the same kind of things. Our desires are identical in all, in all, sense, in all senses. We invest ourselves in the same kind of activities, and we eat at the same table, partaking of the same spiritual food enjoying it, love the same things. The next is the amount of love. In the kingdom of God, Christ will not settle for second place. God himself is a jealous God who requires your full attention. We're told we cannot serve two masters so that we must love one and despise the other. The Lord said to love him with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Unless Christ is loved above all others, we are not worthy to be his disciples. The point here at this point is that Christ requires all our affection as well as our attention. In this case, same love would be having an equal level of affection for Christ and what he offers. There's not one of us who loves Christ or the world to come less than the other. Like, we all have that equal, full love toward Christ. Last, the same kind of love is included here as well. There is such a thing as an affection for the earth. That is, that is an existence, but that kind of affection is not what's in reference here. Rather, it's a love that's found in the new creation, that part of you that's born of God. It is a holy love that takes delight in righteousness and true purity. And in this case, the same love means we have the same spiritual love that all who are born of God possess. And then he says, being of one accord. This refers to the saints being joined together, which is what one accord means. In a much weaker sense, it seems like we're gathered in harmony, but that's not enough. That's too shallow. One accord accents a connection that exists between the saints of God. The saints of God, they're called a body, and a body is something that's joined together. In 1 Corinthians 1.10, we are told to be perfectly joined together, meaning there is not to be one member that is lacking or disconnected. It presents a picture of completion, that when the saints are all connected, then the body is ready to do anything the Lord tells us to do without any member hindering it. So when you hear being of one accord, think of this gathering as you joining yourselves together in order to do the Lord's work, connecting to one another, becoming one body, no one being separate. Then it says, one mind. And just earlier, he said, like-minded. Now he says, one mind. And you would think this would be identical to what was said about being like-minded, but it is not. 
And several versions offer very different words. Some say having the same purpose, same intentions, same goals, same objectives. And while some include both, they say the same mind and purpose. That's the New American. I, I believe that idea is correct. That all members of the body are working with their focus on that same purpose. What is the intention of us being together? Is it not to edify the saints or bring glory to God? Learn and increase in spiritual understanding. Become more ready for Christ's coming. Challenge each other to live more righteously. Provoke one another love of good works. Fellowship with the Father and the Son and remember the Lord's death till he comes. These are not like things that we're focusing on when we gather together. This is like a purpose we have. That day here is none of us have a different focus. We're not moving, none of us are moving in a different direction or are working on a different project. Everyone is adding and contributing to the same thing and are helping each other stay focused on the same thing and the same purpose and helping each other maintain that right focus. Now, one version actually translated it this way. It says, same judgment, which, as you would know, it's a lot stronger than the mind. In that case, even we even arrive at the same conclusions. If there are things we are unclear on, we have to resort to opinions. Sometimes you have to do that, but even those are the same. I've seen it happen. I know you have too. I've seen this happen. Same judgment. Well, it actually is recorded in 1 Corinthians 1.10. It says, be perfectly joined the same mind and judgment. Some translate that opinion. The opinions are even to be the same. Well, how many, how many believers wouldn't be able to receive this? They don't think it's possible, but overall we have to remember with God all things are possible. So with that, I exhort you, rather than focusing on those who are not doing this, it's best to focus on those who are doing it instead. And I have seen these very things happening right here in our assembly. And there are other assemblies outside here, too. A large gathering we had not too long ago, refreshing wise and old people all over the nation gathered together. Perfect harmony. Nothing was disagreed with. No strife. Everyone was indeed of one accord working as a body. You saw it. A large body of people. You see this passage lived out in that case. And with that being the case, I exhort you and strongly encourage you to keep doing this. Maintain this spirit of harmony. It is so fresh. Now, I'll just tell you, it's so refreshing to be able to read passages like this and not think, well, that can't mean what it says. This is impossible. Look at all the division. Look at all the different views, all these different doctrines, all these different denominations. That can't mean what it says. That's impossible. People have said that. I've heard them say that when they read that passage. Rather, I'm thinking, I'm seeing this happen. And I can encourage brethren to keep doing it rather than admonishing them to start doing it. That's a much better conclusion, if you ask me. So men think that's impossible. And even in the world, <laughs> get everyone to agree, that is impossible. Well, I'll, I'll be honest, that is impossible in the flesh. That's not possible. And when you see a lot of division present, it's probably because too many people are living after the flesh. That, I mean, that's just the way it is. I mean, this is what God said, this is what he requires, and this is just what the new creation does. It, it harmonizes with what is born of God. And so, like, while there is time for growth, there's time for patience, forbearance toward one another as we grow, that's the thing we want to encourage them to do well. Grow. <laughs> Come out of that state of infancy so that we can work together more perfectly. So just remember, God, with God, all things are possible. Believe God, brethren. He's faithful to do what he says. We'll now open with prayer, and then Sister Mary will lead us in singing. Dear Heavenly Father,